1919, Germany was a defeated nation, yet it could stage a film on this scale. The beginning of an astonishing decade of filmmaking. Ernst Lubitsch's epic was a brilliant reconstruction of the French Revolution. It was also a mirror of its time, for Germany itself was in revolution. Six months after the war, the German army was allowed by the Allies to combat the new enemy in the East, Bolshevism. Yet Bolshevism had already spread to Germany. In 1918, German soldiers marched beneath the red flag. The revolutionaries claimed to have toppled the Kaiser and brought peace to Europe, but the conflict brought war to the streets of Berlin. The returning soldiers found their families suffering just as they had suffered at the front. Starvation gripped the population as the British maintained their blockade a year after the armistice. None of this was reflected in the cinema. Filmmakers could escape to the sanctuary of their studios where everything was under control. Here, the puppet master is Ernst Lubitsch, the former Jewish comedian, beloved for his impish sense of humor. Here, the butt of Lubitsch's humor is American capitalism. The studios were still simple glass houses, illuminated mostly by daylight. Daylight was the main source, even when artificial lights were used, for electricity was rationed. Military searchlights were commandeered to light big sets. The studios were still small. This is Dekla Bioskop, which would soon be absorbed into Ufa, a studio city at Neubabelsberg outside Berlin. Cinemas proliferated until there seemed to be one on every street. The German industry flourished, for there was an embargo on American films until 1921. This sergeant will become the commander of the German film industry. Eric Pommer had created during the war a company out of the French Eclair called Decla. Soon it will be absorbed into Ufa, and Pommer will become head of production. One of his first successes was a serial which included this pastiche of an American western. It was directed by the young Fritz Lang. In the New Republic, censorship was relaxed. A series of Enlightenment films appeared. Nudity seemed inseparable from stories of prostitution and drug addiction. Director Richard Oswald made a study of homosexuality with Conrad Veidt and Reinhold Schunzel. After 18 months, censorship was reimposed. Germany was gripped by fear of the future, the value of money plummeting as the cost of living soared. The unemployed were fed from the field kitchens that had fed so many of them at the front, and many of them had to give up everything. 
Only cinema could fulfill their wildest dreams. Here, Lubitsch pays tribute to the appetite of the English monarch Henry VIII, played by Emil Jannings. Lubitsch was now seen as one of the top directors in Europe. He staged historical dramas on a scale which amazed and alarmed Hollywood. They knew that extras could be had cheaply by drawing on the army of the unemployed. But who was this man who could bring history to life as no other director but D.W. Griffith? At Tempelhof Studios, the company was honored by a visit from the President of the Republic, Herr Ebert. His social democratic government placed great importance on the earning power of German films, with stars like Emil Jannings and the much-loved Henny Porton. But to the extras, hungry and disillusioned, the sight of the president was an incitement. Shouting down with Ebert, they transformed a crowd scene into an insurrection, and for once in his life, Lubitsch lost control. The rising star of Lubitsch films was the Polish Pola Negri. She plays the laundress who would become a king's mistress. Germany chose stories with an international flavour to help foreign sales. Hollywood now saw Germany as her one major threat. Lubitsch, with his wicked sense of humour, could get away with scenes no American director would dream of shooting. Under a new title, Madame du Barry was an artistic and commercial success in America. And soon Negri and Lubitsch were tempted across the Atlantic, the first of many. The political and social upheavals Germany had suffered after the war had affected every part of society. Art itself was in revolt. Artists expressed disgust and fury with their society, and seeing the excitement it evoked, a group of film designers had adopted a similar style for themselves. Expressionism. There was nothing new in expressionism in the art world, but for the cinema, it was revolutionary. It demanded unrealistic expressions of emotion, not only from the distorted scenery, but also from the actors. Werner Krauss played Dr. Caligari. The film caused a sensation wherever it was shown. In New York, critics raved, while Los Angeles feared a German invasion and stage demonstrations against it. If this is art, they said, it's degenerate. The unconventional approach was encouraged by producer Eric Pommer. We could not rival Hollywood, he said later. We had to do something of our own. Since he had come from making comedies, director Robert Wiener wasn't at all sure about this peculiar design. He'd sleep on it. Also am nächsten Morgen ja noch wieder mal eine Zusammenkunft. Und da sagte ich, ich habe mir das also reiflich überlegt, was das ist, also ich werde es mal mit verrückt bezeichnen, nicht wahr? Ja? Yeah. So verrückt muss der Film aber nun von Anfang an durchgeführt werden, nicht wahr? In jeder Weise. Und darf nichts Normales sein, nicht wahr? Und es muss eben so sein, dann wird das schon werden, ja. Und was, ob die Presse uns dann nachher verreist bis dort hinaus, oder ob es dann eben ein großer Erfolg sein wird, das werden wir sehen. Aber beides ist mir das Geld wert. There had been earlier attempts at expressionism, not only in design, but in acting, particularly from Conrad Veidt. Veidt played César, the somnambulist, asleep for 23 years, here being revealed by Caligari in a fairground tent. The acting and design were so startling that film people argued over the contribution of the director. The controversy about Caligari was that the director did nothing to the quality of, for the quality of the film. It was the three art directors, Röhrig, Warm and Reimann, did everything. And that the director did nothing to it. 
Now I say that the director was a great director, the way how he integrated his actors into the sets. Cesar is used by Caligari to seek out victims and kill them. The victim is Lil Dagova. For writer Hans Janowitz, Caligari symbolized the autocratic government he hated, compelling us to murder or be murdered. For co-author Karl Meyer, Caligari was inspired by his military psychiatrist with whom he had battled to stay out of the army. The story is told through the eyes of a student who searches for the mysterious murderer and reveals it to be the respected head of a lunatic asylum, Dr. Caligari. Authority is overthrown. But a twist is added to the nightmare. The madman is not Caligari, but the storyteller himself. The benevolent doctor soothes his tortured patient. Whatever subversive intentions the writers may have had are themselves subverted. There is, after all, no overthrow of authority. To the outside world, all seemed well with the Weimar Republic and its benevolent president. Returning in triumph from crushing a communist rising in Munich in 1919, the right-wing Freikorps. At Garmisch station, the newsreel cameras catch a glimpse of a master of a future nightmare, one from which the Germans would not awake. The Jewish legend of the golem so fascinated the actor Paul Wegener that he made no fewer than three silent versions. The golem is a statue which comes to life when a Kabbalistic star of David is placed on its chest. A leading actor with the celebrated Max Reinhardt Theatre Company, Wegener shared with many theatre people an enthusiasm for cinema. The true poet of the cinema, he said, must be the camera. That camera was capable of immense power, even though it hardly ever moved. The distorted sets, Henrik Galen's direction, and Wegener's performance aroused the highest praise. The film had a strong influence on the Frankenstein films made a decade later in America. Robert Wiener returned to Expressionism for the dream of a madman.
Expressionism was used throughout the film, but it was fading by 1923. Now, heightened expression was achieved by camera tricks, by lighting, by shadow. F. W. Murnau conjured an atmosphere of terror which nobody who saw Nosferatu would ever forget. But ordinary German filmgoers did not care for these so-called art films. They preferred simple escapism. Adventure in foreign lands was far more popular, like this serial. Produced by Joe Mai, Fritz Lang worked on it as an assistant. If you had no money, you could still go to the cinema with lumps of coal. In the deepest depression, the cinema flourished. 1923 was the year of the Munich Putsch, when General Ludendorff marched with Hitler against the Weimar Republic. They were arrested and Hitler was jailed. Newsreel cameras caught the occasional glimpse, but hardly any films were being made about the inflationary period, the most cataclysmic in the brief history of the German nation. A loaf of bread reached a billion marks. To survive, you had to be paid at lunchtime, or your wages might not cover your family's evening meal. Film editor Julia Wolff came to Berlin from England. Life in Germany in the 1920s was quite crazy. The mark had dropped, and it had no value at all, and the women were selling themselves for a pair of stockings. War profiteers and stock market gamblers had never known such wealth. Families sold their last possessions, while the day's wages for a small firm needed special transport. A defeated Germany was now utterly humiliated. In production was a film designed to restore a vestige of pride to the Germans. The film was dedicated to the German people. Invited to tour the studio at Neu Babelsberg was Julia Wolf. And then finally they took us to the great dragon, of which they were terrifically proud and justifiably so, because nothing had ever been created like it for films before. And it was enormous, and it had blinking eyes. And although we didn't have colour in those days, it was all coloured golden, fiery red, and it really looked fierce. The designer of the dragon was Karl Vollbrecht, and Eric Kettelhut was an art director. Und der Drache, der oh, 16 Meter war, wie es war ungefähr lang, und äh, wurde bedient eigentlich von unterhalb. Er kam doch einen schrägen Weg abwärts runter. Da waren unten so sechs, acht Mann, die den Drachen auf einer Schiene schoben, und der Drache thronte eigentlich auf einem oder auf zwei Eisengeschichten. Daran war er festgemacht und schwebte eigentlich über dieser Schräge auf dem Boden, sodass er nirgends irgendwo auf, nur der Schwanz hinten der Schurte. Die vier Mann saßen dann im Drachen, rechts und links an jedem Bein einer, und zwei Mann saßen vorne, wo der Kopf bedient wurde.
Siegfried bathes in the dragon's blood. The Nibelungen has taken on a new resonance, as if Fritz Lang and his team had predicted rather than recreated. Ah, Nibelungen is the beginning of the Nazi style. If you see Nibelungen now, Nibelungen now you think it could have been staged by Benno von Ahren as one of the rallies, you know. Perhaps Benno von Arendt recalled this film when he staged the Nazi rallies. It was one of Hitler's favorite films. It was said of these well-drilled German extras that their directors owed much to their military training. Fritz Lang had been an officer in the Austrian army himself, and as a director was a martinet, although he worked quietly and never shouted. Lang was an artist, a painter trained as an architect, and he had a remarkable eye. Scenes like these deeply impressed Hollywood directors like King Vidor. Vidor said to me, in Hollywood, the cameraman lights the star. In Europe, he lights the set. And there you have it, and you see it incomparably in those great German silent films. It's the design and the decor which is doing the work, really telling the story. At Neubabelsberg was built the primeval forest ancient trees made from plaster which could be transformed by light to evoke the dim and distant past. Lang rejected Wagner's version and made his own film from the Teutonic myths. Divided into two parts, the film lasted more than four hours. German films were much too long, and they were all cut later on by me, mostly. You had to bring them down in length. Well, they were too long, too, uh, too ponderous for an English audience. It's a different psychology entirely, you know. The fact that the German films were slow-moving I cannot recall worried me in the least, because one could feast one's eyes on the design, which possibly one was supposed to do. And that sombre pace was so much part of the sombre stories so many of them told. It wasn't until the horror of inflation was over and the money supply had been stabilised that the Germans made a film about it. It was significant that G.W. Pabst could find no money in Germany for his story and only got backing from France. Bedecked in borrowed finery, Asta Nielsen gave a tragic portrait of a poor girl, now a rich man's mistress, who turns on her lover. Nielsen was a goddess on her way down. In the same film was a goddess on her way up. Greta Garbo from Sweden. Garbo played a middle-class girl driven to prostitution. Garbo was very nervous, Pabst told me, during the shooting of George Street. And for that reason, Pabst overcranked some of the scenes just to get her slowing down her actions. Garbo did not stay long in Germany. Louis B. Mayer, visiting Berlin, invited her with her mentor, Moritz Stiller, to the MGM studios in Hollywood. The Ufa studios in Neubabelsberg were expanding and overspending. Ufa now controlled many of the German production companies and turned films out on an assembly line, much like Hollywood. Serials, comedies, dramas.
The old Zeppelin hangar at Starken was used as a studio outside Uther. Here, sets could be built to a height of 80 feet. The simple days of a glass roof and a camera are gone for good. This studio is equipped as well as any in Hollywood. It even had tram rails laid for street scenes. Handling all this equipment, as well as vast crowds of extras, required a smooth and efficient production machine. L'Allemagne a une supériorité sur les Français. C'est une obéissance absolue sans contestation. Il n'y avait pas de contestation. Quand on avait décidé que ce serait ça, c'était pas autre chose. The German stagehand, in German you had to call him Bühne, a shortening of Bühnenarbeiter. I mean, you said Bühne, he really came, he came up, clacked his heels and said, Jawohl. There was a strong sense of purpose now that Germany was producing more films than any other country in Europe. But things could still go wrong, as parodied in this film about an assembly cutter who has to get a print ready by six o'clock for an important premiere of a film starring Lil Dagover. When the film is shown to the public, she realizes she has made a terrible mistake. Lil Dagover has breakfast. The thing that impressed me most about the Germans were they were such a mixed bunch. They weren't keen on politics, they weren't keen on anything except films. And as such, there was terrific comradeship amongst them. And that's how they made their films. And they were always trying to discover something new that they could handle. One of the greatest gifts the German studios brought the cinema was what they called the unchained camera. A dazzling freedom from the tripod seen first in films by Lupu Pick and Murnau. They constantly looked for new ways to extend the power of the camera. A man's sensation of being crushed and pursued by his surroundings was brilliantly achieved by the use of double exposure and mobile sets. The effect was elaborated by Murnau and cameraman Karl Freund two years later in The Last Laugh with Emil Jannings. This was the film that showed the world in 1924 that the camera had no limitations. Producer Eric Pommer had said, try to invent something mad. Pushing the camera across the lobby on a bicycle seemed mad enough at the time. Mounting it on Karl Freund's ample stomach attached to the electricity supply seemed positively hazardous, but they went further. This model demonstrates how they zoomed before the invention of the zoom lens, suspending the camera like a cable car. To convey an impression of drunken euphoria, Yannings is wheeled on the same platform as the camera. The story of The Last Laugh, told with only one subtitle, revolves around the German respect for uniforms.
Yannings plays a hotel doorman who is demoted because he is too old. He is reduced to being a lavatory attendant, stripped of his precious uniform and in abject despair. This is where most German films would have finished, but Karl Meyer wrote a parody of all happy endings. The doorman inherits a fortune and his employers are suddenly his servants. Despite the happy ending, the film did not earn the dollars Palmer had hoped for. But Yannings was hailed as the greatest actor of the cinema and in every country the critics raved. Yannings starred in an even more adventurous film the following year, set in a circus and involving camera work by Karl Freund, which brought yet more admiration to German filmmakers. Directors like E. A. Dupont wanted a new realism, allied to all that their technicians had learnt. Yannings and Lier de Putti played their roles much more naturalistically than in the Expressionist days. Ich habe also als Beleuchter mit auf der Beleuchterbrücke gesessen und habe runtergeschaut, habe gesehen, wie ein Film inszeniert wird und all das hat mich mächtig interessiert. When the studio cleared for lunch, the electricians ate their sandwiches in the gantries. Es wurde also ruhig im Atelier, nur wie man von oben bemerken konnte, Emil Jannings und Lia de Putti waren zurückgeblieben, zogen sich in diesen äh, Zirkuswagen zurück und gaben sich dann dort den allerlebhaftesten Bezeugungen ihrer gegenseitigen Zuneigung hin, was von den Arbeitern natürlich mit größtem Interesse beobachtet wurde. Sie waren mucksmäuschenstill. Und als das nur alles den Höhepunkt überschritten hatte, brachen sie in einen riesigen Beifall aus und die beiden lachten nach oben und es hat ihnen auch nichts Besonderes ausgemacht, denn sie so lieh die Putti war ein außerordentlich fideles Huhn. Jannings returns after stabbing to death his mistress's lover. Such was the prestige of German technicians that the top American cameraman, Charles Rocher, came to Berlin. He watched the production of Murnau's Faust, the supreme example of German fantasy. Every shot seemed a miracle of imagination, allied to equally brilliant mechanics. The design was derived from old engravings rather than expressionism and the flight sequence required a whole stage at Tempelhof Studios. Ufa wanted to cast the film with actors of international stature. Lillian Gish agreed to play Gretchen, but made difficult conditions. A rising young actress called Leni Riefenstahl, working on the next stage, tested in a blonde wig. But the role went to an unknown called Camilla Horn. 
Emil Jannings played the devil, and the Swedish Jöste Ekman played Faust, both in youth and old age. Camilla Horn was deeply impressed by director Murnau. Für mich war er der liebe Gott. Ich habe nur zu ihm aufgeschaut. Und ich tat alles, was ich ihm von den Augen ablesen konnte. Denn ich wusste, dass er mich mochte, sehr mochte. Aber er war eher streng zu mir, war sehr streng. Im Gegenteil, man hat mich zum Beispiel durch das, das ganze Atelier durch den Schnee geschleift, an, den, an diesen Eisenketten, als er mich zum, zum Scheiterhaufen brachte. Und da war natürlich, also die, ich, ich musste Widerstand leisten und äh, war, war, hatte nackte Beine unter meinem Büßergewand. Und das blutete. Und ich, 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 sah, ich sagte, schauen Sie, Herr Mona, das blutet ja. Das will ich gerade. Also ich weiß nicht, ob man so etwas nennen kann. Das war beinahe ein bisschen sadistisch, aber er war es trotzdem nicht. Gretchen, accused of killing her baby, is burned at the stake. Faust abandons his pact with the devil for the sake of his love for her. Faust was the last German film to be made by Murnau. He left for the United States, yet another major director to be lost to Hollywood. <laughs> Bursting upon Berlin in 1926 was a masterpiece from Soviet Russia, the music by a German composer, Edmund Meisel. It was a huge popular success and to filmmakers a revelation. Ja, da war alles besonders. Es hat niemals ähnliche Einstellungen gegeben wie in diesem Film, in diese dramatischen, also dramatische Einstellungen. Das heißt, es waren keine stehenden, leblosen Bilder. Und dann war bei diesem Film auffallend, was es vorher überhaupt nicht in der Form gegeben hat, der Schnitt. Und dieser Film hat mich tatsächlich sehr aufgewühlt und von diesem Augenblick hatte ich das Gefühl, dass Film Kunst sein könnte. One of those inspired was Walter Ruttmann, who brought a new energy to German films. Ruttmann has a un very a mastery of feeling of movement at all. He was a musician, and editing and music have very much in common to do. So beats and other business and so. And he was a masterful editor. Obgleich er damals ein sehr überzeugter Kommunist war, hatte ich mit ihm einen blinden Kontakt, weil er ein echter Künstler war. Er war sehr begabt und er wohnt in der Nähe und hat mich oft besucht und dann sein Film Berlin. War großartig. Es war eigentlich der erste abendfüllende Dokumentarfilm ohne jede Handlung. Editing in German films was usually done by the director. Ruttmann used it for social comment. Fritz Lang made social comment through a monumental vision of the future, written by his wife, Thea von Harbu, in which the working class is kept literally underground and out of sight.
special effects echo the Joe Mai serial and the Italian epic Cabiria. Massive sets were made still more massive by the ingenious Schuftan process. A figure is seen through a hole in a mirror. The mirror reflecting a small model, making it seem full size by comparison. A stage at Babelsberg, photographed through a mirror which reflects miniature skyscrapers, is transformed into a city of the future. To Europeans, New York seemed the city of the future. In 1924, Eric Pommer and Fritz Lang sailed to New York to study American production methods. Und der Dampfer lag am Pier und uns gegenüber war eine Straße, die war ganz hell erleuchtet und Lichtreklamen drehten sich. Und es war irgendwie wie ein, wie ein Märchentraum. Und dort bekam ich die erste Idee zu Metropolis. These shots took 18 technicians nearly four weeks to achieve, the road and air traffic being animated a frame at a time like a cartoon. The film concluded with a message for capital and labor that between the head and the hand must be the heart. Ufa had been in trouble before Metropolis. Paramount, MGM and Universal raced each other to Berlin. In return for a massive loan, they seized control of distribution. Ufa's distribution company was now also controlled by Paramount and Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Parufamet. Pommer, who hadn't been happy with the deal, was forced to resign. He went to Hollywood. Metropolis had gone way over budget. The stronger mark made the films harder to sell abroad. When the film came out, it proved a financial disaster for Ufa, which threatened to bring down the entire German film industry. To save the flagship of the German film industry, the right-wing press baron, Alfred Hugenberg, moved in to take control. Hugenberg was a fervent nationalist, and became leader of the German National Party in 1928. He wanted to be the bulwark against the onrush of American films, but it was too late. Eighty percent of the screen time of German cinemas was dominated by Hollywood. Not that Berliners cared. They liked American films. The stabilization of the mark had brought back the gaiety of the pre-war years. Berlin really was a sort of wonderful sin city. You felt that everybody was prepared to do anything that might give them pleasure. It was a sort of forced gaiety, not entirely forced, uh, I think a rather genuine feeling of gaiety, but the gaiety that comes from desperation. There was another side to Berlin, mirrored in the social dramas of Gerhard Lamprecht, dealing with poverty and unemployment. Lamprecht was a maverick, not part of Expressionism or any other style, and unjustly overlooked by film history. G.W. Pabst was the leading figure of a new style which reflected a Russian influence. A lost diamond has been recovered. A 
private detective reflects on the money he will make out of this stroke of luck. Having telephoned the owner, his greed overwhelms him. He imagines himself receiving the $50,000 reward. thought that that was a that was the future of, of silent films that they would they would develop that excellence and that's why I was I was horrified at the thought of talking pictures talking pictures had already arrived in America but with the huge costs involved Europe was holding back some of the finest German silence would be made in the next two years Mountain films had become immensely popular. Shot on location, they were a breath of fresh air after the claustrophobia of the studio pictures. The star of most of these films was Leni Riefenstahl. The white hell of Pitts Palou was made on location in the Engadine. The actors had to do their own stunts and sometimes paid the price, as here, with a vicious crack on the head. Trapped high on a mountain, the girl's husband is badly injured. The company worked on the Mortarach Glacier, with temperatures often 30 degrees below freezing. The mountain films had been pioneered by Dr. Arnold Funk, with whom Leni Riefenstahl had been working for some years. Funk was persuaded by Riefenstahl to work with G.W. Pabst because she felt the film needed more human emotion. A climber who has accompanied the couple sacrifices himself for the girl's husband. Riefenstahl responded to Pabst's direction but felt that Funk took unnecessary risks. Und denken Sie, stellen Sie, stellt euch vor, ich bin ungefähr fünf Meter hochgezogen, hat doch der Funk, ich muss sagen, dieser Kerl, damals war ich wütend auf ihn, durch eine vorbereitete Sprengung mit Dynamit eine ganze Eislawine auf mich runterstürzen lassen. Ich bin fast verrückt geworden, denn der Staub ging mir in die Nase, in die Ohren rein. Und nicht nur das, die haben... Ich habe geschrien, aufhören, aufhören, ich halte das nicht mehr aus. Und dann haben die aber darauf gar nicht gehört. Die haben mich einfach weitergezogen bis zur Kante und über die Eiskante, sodass ich also mindestens zwei Wochen blau und grüne Flecke am Körper hatte. Ich hätte ihn damals umbringen können, Frank, so wütend war ich. Aber das hat er mit uns allen so gemacht. Funk's mastery of the technique of the mountain film has seldom been excelled. The film was a tremendous international success and a triumph too for Riefenstahl, who thanks to Pabst emerged a bigger star than ever. Pabst had a knack of making stars. To play the role of Lulu, which Asta Nielsen had performed five years before, he had brought Louise Brooks from America. Pabst, who came from the theatre, was the best director of actors Louise Brooks had ever met. But what I'm getting at is that he treated everyone completely differently. Now with Cotton, the great actor from the theatre, 
He would take him aside, and in that careful, precise way, they would talk over everything. Now, that didn't really mean anything, because Pabst never wanted a set performance. He wanted it to be new and living. Pabst was reversing a trend. Instead of creating a German star only to lose her to Hollywood, he took an American actress and made her a star. Pabst saw in Louise Brooks an erotic quality which Hollywood had barely exploited. Sex was a theme that in American and English films could only be treated very superficially. But the German films in those days started talk, beginning to treat sex themes at a much deeper level. The camera work was uh, extraordinarily non-realistic and basically enormously sensual. In ten years, the German cinema had created and discarded style after style, experimenting and improving until it was hard to believe that better films could be made. G.W. Pabst emerged from this decade as perhaps the greatest of all German directors. A man sensitive to technique and design, but who put human beings before it all. This scene from one of his last silents achieves what so many silent filmmakers have been aiming for. To express several ideas at once with pictures and music and no words. <laughs> <laughs> 